Today's Side by Side is going to take us on a two-day trip today and tomorrow to look at another one of those who suffered persecution as a consequence of the Covenanter persecutions back in the 17th century. The story today is about a young man called Ralph Gemmel. He was born in 1669, which is a time when persecution for following people's own conscience, worshipping as they believed was right, was at, at its most a highest point. His father was George Gemmel. He was from a long line of ancestors. He had a small but a fertile estate of Craigfoot that was situated on the banks of Irvine, near to where the river pours itself out into the Atlantic. But within that castle, it is said that there was heard neither the humble voice of prayer nor the sweet melody of sacred praise. His aim was really to destroy everyone uh, who sought to worship God in a way that was different from the state church of the time. But his mother was quite different. She was someone who had a faith and she had come into that marriage with a background in gospel understanding. But because she feared her husband, she often violated her own conscience to please him and keep the peace. And so she sinfully regarded him more than her heavenly father. But although she had yielded too much for the sake of domestic peace, at the same time, she really was quite keen to try and instruct her two sons, Ralph and Edward, to follow the Lord Jesus Christ. Edward showed no interest whatsoever, but Ralph had an inclination. Though any time he tried to show any compassion, or when he would speak out in favour of those who were being persecuted, his father would just mock him. It was a difficult time. He had a tutor, and the tutor was, as it says, he was, according to the curate of the parish, entirely devoted to the wicked government. And so he really didn't help Ralph at all. He tended to favour Edward, his brother. So that whenever Edward was invited to go out on the sports or to go to some savage military in search of meetings or whatever, well then Ralph would be left behind. But it was good for him because that's when his mother took the opportunity to have those personal discussions and chats with him. And she would talk to him at length about the gospel, about the Lord Jesus Christ. But she did remind him that it's going to be through the fire and the water that you'll be brought into a place of peace. But remember that Jesus will be present with you in every trial and he will always enable you to overcome even when things seem extremely dark and very depressing. Little did he know that those words would be very important for him. Sometimes, sometime later after this, his mother died. It was a lingering illness occasioned by her grief for the state of the persecuted church and the hard-hearted severity and wickedness of her husband. Her dying advice to Ralph was very short and simple, and this is what she said. Ralph, I have often violated my conscience. I have often, for the sake simply of domestic peace, done things that I knew that I shouldn't. I should have been much more resolute and more public in serving God and my Redeemer. But I know he will be merciful to my unrighteousness, and my sins and iniquities he will remember no more. I will see him because he loved me, and I will enter into the pres his presence for because Christ has died for me. But I don't want you to follow that part of my example, which I'm now sorry for. You will have the same difficulties to encounter. You'll have the same reproaches. And if you take a more decided part than I have done in the interests of the suffering church, and a more open and avowed path in the service of God, you will have lots more trials to endure. But put your trust in God, and he will never leave you and never forsake you. Just like Helen of the Glen, the same words. Of course, his brother, Edward, and his father would mock him at every opportunity when he showed any signs of weakness. But Ralph began, well, he began by making a choice. Is it going to be the state church or is it going to be the faith of his mother? And more than three months had passed since his mother's death and he was walking uh, out just along the seashore, along the coast, the banks of the Irvine towards the sea. 
and as the light was fading, he could see those indistinct summits, summits of Aran Island, and all had a tendency to draw him into serious thought, and just to make him think about how short his life was, and what was he doing with this life. And he was weighing up these things, and as he was doing so, he began to, you know, to hear the sound of singing and preaching. And it was that he then found himself in the company of a number of those Presbyterians and Covenanters who were out in the open, having a time of fellowship and worship in a place of secret. And as he approached, they seemed a little bit alarmed because they thought that maybe he was one of those who was like a, he was out searching for people like them because they knew what his family was. But as some of those present had been tenants of his father, they recognised that he was not of the same spirit or nature of his father. And he came alongside them and he really did take seriously what they were saying. They told him, you know, it's going to be really hard. It's going to be really difficult and we can only promise you suffering and trial because we've been driven from our houses and possessions and our families are left to wander and weep in poverty. They're exposed to contempt and subjected to the insults of the brutality of soldiers. Torture, imprisonment and banishment are prepared for us and for many of us, there's a price on our heads. But if you're resolved to put your trust in Christ and follow him through good and through bad, although we can't promise you any of this world's comforts or honours, we can promise you this, that although you might be perplexed, you'll never be in despair. And of course, that was where he was willing to meet with them and stay with them. And he arranged to meet the next week, one week later, and that's what he did. But Scarcely had there been a psalm and a prayer concluded when the alarm was given by someone who was watching at a distance and a party of dragoons were riding towards the house. Now in that house that he had met that day there was a space under the floorboards and they had made a kind of a secret place. The old man wanted Ralph to go in there, the minister, but Ralph would have none of it because he said he was young and the other man was old and there was a greater risk. But Ralph was just saved that day from death because his father spoke, as it were, on his behalf, embarrassing though it was. But it was necessary before Ralph's pardon and liberty that his father would promise that his conduct was going to be okay in the future and he was going to abide by the government. And so he had to take what's called the test. It was a kind of oath by which the parties swore to renounce all activities or associations with these covenanters, these Presbyterians. And did Ralph swear the oath? Well, yes, he did. It was when he was threatened with imprisonment and death, when he was reproached by his father and dishonouring his family. Although his tongue kind of faltered, he took the oath. And in taking the oath, I mean, his heart was torn in two and he was really caught between these two different opinions. He was warned by his father and his father said, I can't ever help you again. If you get into this situation, you're on your own. And so for a time, he went with his father and he mounted his horse and he went alongside the other soldiers as they hounded down the Christians who were given away by various people who were traitors. And yet every time he did it, his conscience would condemn him. And it's, you know, when he went to bed, guilt would come over his, his mind and his heart. And on one particular occasion, it's as he said he thought he felt like there was a visitation of death about him. A cold sweat suffused, suffused his body, and he could hardly put his head on the pillow. Quick as lightning flashed, did his mind go across the various events of the past months and all the things that he'd done that were wrong. And that was when he came to a true repentance, a seriousness of heart, and he, tur he turned back to the Lord and he rested in him. Well, of course, when he reflects on all these things, he himself again, one shortly after this, found himself having made this fresh commitment to serve Jesus down by the shores of the, of the sea again. But this day, something different happened. This day, there were soldiers and their drums, the magistrates, and with them there was a young girl of 18 or 19. She had been caught worshipping along with the other Christians, and now she was being taken and put on a st uh, and, and fastened to a stake at low tide. 
she was given opportunities to renounce her faith, which she would not do, and Ralph had to watch as the, as the incoming tide slowly engulfed her. Her eyes looked up to heaven, and a calm peacefulness settled on her face, while every succeeding wave advanced further up her body, till at last the waters rolled over her head and hid her from the eyes of everyone else. But that had a profound effect upon Ralph, which we shall learn of tomorrow. And I look forward to telling you the rest of the story, God willing.